Chapter 1 Carl Boyles Jeffrey Joe Hicks was a snitch. Carl Boyles was certain of it, but Boyles needed proof. Convicts at the U.S. Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas hated informants even more than they hated guards. A hack, as guards at the maximum security prisons were called, was simply doing his job. But an inmate snitch was a Judas. And the best way to deal with the rat, as far as Boyles was concerned, was to kill it. Boyles had been suspicious of Hicks from the moment they met eight months earlier when Hicks was still being held in an area of the ancient prison reserved for new inmates not yet assigned permanent cells. Hicks had stood out among the fish, prison slang for newcomers. At 28, he had a small build and pubescent appearance, but it was his demeanor that everyone noticed. Hicks was terrified. Guys were damn near fighting each other over him, Boyles recalled later. They said, oh, we gotta protect this poor kid. Why, he's white, he doesn't wanna do anything with the ninjas, and he's afraid that they're going to take him and fuck him? Somebody's gotta do something. Boyles had been the first to actually meet Hicks, but at the time, he claimed he simply wanted to give Hicks some advice, but guards suspected that the 48-year-old Boyles had a different motive. The Federal Bureau of Prisons identified Boyles in his files as a sexual predator, a convict who forced weaker inmates to satisfy his sexual needs. It wasn't the goodness of his heart that caused Carl Boyles to search out Jeffrey Hicks, a guard remarked. It was a lower section of his anatomy. Except for a short stint when he was free after an escape, Boyles had spent 23 consecutive years in prison a convicted cop killer, kidnapper, and triple murderer. He had been taken into custody for the first time at the age of 12. Boyles had literally grown up in jail, and a few inmates knew their way as well around a prison or had better jailhouse instincts. At Leavenworth, all convicts are released from their cells at 6 a.m. and are free to roam the large prison compound relatively unstricted until 10 p.m. when they are locked up for the night. Boyles had gone to the fish tier to meet Hicks within days after he arrived. First time in the penitentiary, Boyles asked, yeah. It can be pretty scary until a man figures out what's going on, Boyles had said, shaking a cigarette out of a pack for himself and then offering one to Hicks. Where you from? A state joint in Michigan, Hicks had answered. Oh yeah, Boyles had remarked with interest. Well, what they got you for? Uh, I can't say, Hicks had to answer. I got an appeal, you know, still in court. Sure, kid, Boyles had replied, his mood noticeably colder. He had dropped his cigarette, stomped on it, and the prison's tile floor and left. Months later, when he recalled that meeting, Boyles explained, when Hicks told me he was a state prisoner from Michigan and then refused to tell me his crime, I knew there was something spooky about him. You see, there are only two reasons why the feds accept state prisoners. The guy is either such a mean son of a bitch that the state joint can't handle him or the state has to get rid of him because he'd be killed by convicts if they put him in a state joint. Now, even an idiot can see that Hicks ain't no ruthless motherfucker. So I figured there was something wrong with him. I figured he was a snitch. Just because Boyles had suddenly lost his interest in Hicks didn't mean others had. It took prison officials two weeks to process Hicks' paperwork. And by that time, another convicted killer, an alleged sexual predator, had invited Hicks to move into his cell. Guards and inmates assumed Hicks was the inmate's punk, serving as the convict's partner in return for protection. But a few months after Hicks moved into the inmate's cell, something strange had happened. Hicks and his cellmate were accused of plotting an elaborate helicopter escape. Lieutenant Edward Gallegos, who exposed the plot, said Hicks' cellmate had tried to hire a helicopter pilot to swoop into the prison yard and rescue them. As punishment, Hicks was moved into an isolation cell in the prison's hole. His cellmate received a worse punishment. He was sent to the federal penitentiary in Marion, Illinois, the harshest prison operated by the federal government. At Marion, prisoners were kept locked in one-man cells 23 hours a day and denied nearly all privileges. The only way guards find out anything in here is when someone snitches, Boyles complained. Someone had tipped off the cops to that helicopter plot, and it sure as hell wasn't the guy who got shipped to marry him. After, I was certain Hicks was a snitch. When Hicks was released from the hole, another white inmate 
took him in as a cell partner and sexual punk. Boyles knew this inmate. They were friends and Boyles was worried about him. He figured that Hicks was going to do something to get the inmate into trouble. Boyles decided to investigate Hicks' background and he began by visiting Harold Gooden. Every prison has its oddballs and at Leavenworth, Gooden was one of them. A convicted counterfeiter, he was the only inmate in the penitentiary who subscribed to the Architectural Digest. Gooden was a college educated and honorably discharged Navy veteran and a bearded, pipe smoking, self proclaimed prison philosopher who passed his time by writing what he claimed was an epic novel. He also had the largest magazine collection at Leavenworth, much of it not the convict's typical reading materials, Penthouse and Hustler but old copies of the Sunday edition of the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, and Harper's. But these were not what Balls had come looking for when he paused outside Gooden's open cell door, knocked, and waited to be invited in, a sign of respect between convicts in the prison. I need to borrow a few magazines, Boyle explained. Help yourself, Carl, Gooden told him. Anything in particular? True crime, Boyle's replied. Besides his roles of highbrow publications, Gooden also kept a large collection of sleazy detective magazines. He subscribed to them, not because he enjoyed reading them, but to identify inmates who had committed particularly heinous sex crimes. After snitches, the most despised inmates in Leavenworth were child molesters, rapists, and other sexual deviants. Sex offenders gave criminals a bad name, convicts claimed. Most inmates either were married or had been, and were... Most inmates, most inmates were either married or had been, and many were fathers. Like men outside prison, they didn't want their mothers, wives, and children to be victims of a deviant. Bowles took a few magazines and returned to his cell where he scanned them, but he found nothing of interest and returned to Gooden's cell. Carl, I think you should check this one out, Gooden volunteered, handing Bowles a copy of Inside Detective. Page 36 was folded down, so Boyles turned to it. He saw a two-column, black-and-white photograph of a freckle-faced boy grinning into the camera. Above it was a headline, Stop the Sexual Sadist from Abducting Boys. The story below said that 13-year-old boy in the picture had been forced off a road while riding his bicycle on October 19, 1986 in Green Oak Township, Michigan. The driver had jumped from his Jeep, dragged the boy inside the vehicle, and sped away. A few days later, the youngster's naked body was found abandoned in a forest. He had been sexually molested and strangled. When Boyles turned the page, the baby-faced Jeffrey Joe Hicks stared up at him. The caption underneath the photograph read, Hicks has a long history of molesting children sexually. Boyles closed the magazine, said thanks, and took it back to his cell. There, he read the entire story. It reported that Hicks had first gotten into trouble in January 1975 when he was 16 and abducted a 12-year-old boy at knife point, forced him to swallow several tranquilizers, and molested him. Despite the seriousness of the crime, Hicks was put on five years probation. Seven years later, he sexually assaulted two youngsters but was released on probation again. Only after he was accused of kidnapping and murder Only after he was accused of kidnapping and murder was he finally jailed. At his trial, Hicks' attorney admitted their client was guilty, but said he shouldn't be sent to prison because he himself was a victim. Hicks had been raped as a child by a psychiatrist who was supposed to be treating him for deviant behavior, they said, and it was that molestation that caused him to attack young boys. Hicks testified at his own defense, describing how he had held his victim's hands down and strangled the cyclist with his belt after abusing them. A jury ignored Hicks' plea for mercy and sentenced him to life in prison, plus 65 to 100 years. Now, Boyles knew why state officials in Michigan had arranged for Hicks to serve his sentence in a federal prison rather than in a state institution. His crime was so monstrous and had attracted such wide publicity that Hicks, would have been instantly recognized in a state prison and most likely would have been physically attacked or even murdered by other inmates. In the federal prison system, however, Hicks would be safe 
because he would be just another anonymous convict, unless, of course, someone put word out about his crime. Clutching the magazine in his hand, Boyles walked toward the prison law library where he planned to photocopy the article. He would post copies on the bulletin boards in each cell block. But before he reached the copy machine, he decided to tell Hicks' partner about his discovery. He walked directly to the cell, entered without knocking, and tossed the magazine to Hicks' cellmate. Hicks wasn't there. Why that little fucker the inmate snapped when he saw the photograph. Boyles took back the magazine and started back toward the law library. Midway down the tier, he spotted Jeffrey Hicks coming toward him. Hicks had been doing his cellmate's laundry and was carrying several carefully folded items. Boyles grinned and kept walking until Hicks was close, then lifted the magazine so that Hicks was suddenly face to face with his own photograph. You little bastard, a voice yelled from behind Boyles. It was Hicks' cellmate who had come charging out on the tier. Terrified, Hicks dropped the laundry, spun around, and bolted toward the two guards stationed near the stairwell. They hustled him out of the cell block. There was no longer any need for Boyles to make copies of the story, but he made one for himself anyway. I spread word about Hicks because I wanted everyone to see here how cops work, he said. It wasn't the fact that Hicks was a sexual deviant that bothered Boyles, it was the fact that he was a snitch. The guards will deny it, but I know exactly what happened, Boyles said later. Some hack from Michigan called up a lieutenant here and said, hey, I got a prisoner and I got to get him out of my state institution before someone kills him. Now a lieutenant here says, well, why should we take him? Does he cooperate? And the guy in Michigan says, fuck yes, he'll cooperate. Because if he don't, we'll tell everyone he's a baby raper and they'll kill his ass. When Hicks gets down here, the lieutenant says, hey boy, we will put you in population. But at the same time, you got to come out to us every once in a while and tell us things. Because if you don't, then someone might just slip up and let folks know about your past. Don't you see what happens next? Suddenly, some lieutenant is breaking up a bigger helicopter escape. Lieutenant Gallegos discounted Boyle's scenario. He's telling how he operates, how he thinks, how he manipulates people, said Gallegos. Believe me, we don't have to do anything to force these guys to snitch. Most will tell on each other in a second. Prison officials acknowledged that they had accepted Hicks from state officials in Michigan because he would have been harmed in a state prison. But they denied that Hicks had But they denied that Hicks had been planted in Leavenworth or coerced into providing Gallegos information. This prisoner was sent to Leavenworth because of the length of his sentence, a prison spokesman said. We felt he needed to be placed in a high security environment. A few days after Boyles exposed Hicks, however, the young inmate was quietly transferred to a lower security federal prison in another state. The prison grapevine is such that we had to move this prisoner to a much lower security prison, an official explained. Otherwise, his past would have been exposed and he would have been in danger. Boyles saw things differently. I don't care what they say. They use Hicks and now they are rewarding him by moving him to an easier joint. That's how both sides work in this place. When someone's weak like Hicks, when someone weak like Hicks comes in, then each side preys on him. A short time after Hicks had gone, Boyles heard through the grapevine that another fish was coming to Leavenworth and that he, like Hicks, was scared. No one knew why prison officials were sending Thomas Edgar Little to a maximum security penitentiary. Little had never been to prison before and he was young and weak. Boyles figured Thomas Little was someone he wanted to meet. <laughs>